What's going on, everybody? I'm Jay, an internet Calvinist. <laughs> At least that's the title that was given to me by my new friend, Dr. Layton Flowers. I'm going to explain what I'm talking about in just a minute. But by the way, Dr. Flowers, if you're watching, uh, I, I say my name at the beginning of every single one of my videos. So if you've been watching a couple of my videos, uh, you should have caught that. <laughs> my name is Jay, the reformed Puerto Rican dude. Um, also, the video that you were critiquing with, uh, Dr., uh, with, with Keith Foskey uh, had my name written right under my screen. So there you have it. Hello, I'm Jay. <laughs> nice to meet you. So for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, I lately had a run-in with Soteriology 101's Leighton Flowers. Um, and if you don't know what Soteriology 101 is, it's a channel essentially just dedicated to proving Calvinism wrong. And it's run primarily by Dr. Flowers. So uh, we had a bit of a back and forth on social media. Um, I made a joke about Soteriology 101 to which they responded. Uh... I made a video about that interaction and then Dr. Flowers made a video briefly addressing that video as well as critiquing another video that I had made earlier with Keith Foskey going over Calvinism. So, of course, now I'm doing this video in response to Dr. Flowers' video. I will admit I didn't watch the whole video. I only watched the first hour. Um, the whole video is about an hour and 45 minutes. But what I'm going to respond to, I think, addresses the core of the matter. So here we go. First with his comments regarding my original video, which essentially was a critique of a video he sent me during that whole uh, social media exchange. His video was called, Was Pelagius Really a Pelagian? I'll be sure to put the links to all these videos that I'm referring to in the description below, by the way. So don't, don't worry about it. You don't have to track all this stuff down. So in that video, he was speaking with Dr. Ali Bonner, and they were discussing how essentially Pelagius was falsely accused of teaching what we now know as Pelagianism. And, and by the way, Dr. Flowers, if you can, please be sure to watch more than the first few minutes of uh, on this video. I think uh, you'll have a lot more context if you do. I know that you watched my other video, and it was only like a few minutes um, but in that video, I gave you more context later on, but I guess you never got to it. So you didn't mention that. All right. So the first thing I want to address is that Dr. Flowers comments on how he typically doesn't use Soteriology 101, uh, to post his personal things, right? He doesn't use that, that, that page as his personal social media. And he, he says how other, other theologians and things like that, um, uh, such as Dr. James White, <laughs> Uh, does post both personal and uh, theology and stuff like that in his own or in his private page, right? So, so you may see Dr. Flowers um, arguing theology on one thread of his Twitter account, and on the other thread, he, he'll be showing off his new Kuji or, or something like that. And Dr. Flowers goes on to say that he keeps his personal posts to his personal media page and his soteriology stuff on Soteriology 101. Makes sense. And then he says, I don't know if you want to see me doing things like riding a bicycle. And I, I just have to say, Dr. Flowers, I think I would like to see you riding a bicycle. Or maybe playing basketball or, or something. I, I, I want to see if I can take you on. <laughs> or maybe challenge you to a bike race or one-on-one -on -one basketball or, or something. Especially basketball. I, I love playing basketball. Uh, who knows? Maybe I fly out to Texas sometime and play you. We we can even call it the the, the soteriology slam or something. <laughs> so, you know, you never know. Maybe, maybe we can do that one day. But all right. So in all seriousness, one of the first things that you said was that I was wrong for saying that your video on the one hand says that Pelagius wasn't teaching anything new. And on the other hand, he wasn't teaching what he was accused of teaching. Okay. So if you aren't familiar with the other videos and that just sounded like craziness. I'm going to explain it all in just a moment. By the way, Dr. Flowers, the way that I'm going to approach this video is by addressing things that you have said, certain points that you have said, and then I'm going to address each one, one by one. Okay. So, um, so like I said, um, what I had said was that in that video where you, um, the, the one called, uh, was Pelagius really a Palladian? I said that I found an inconsistency because on the one hand, you were saying that uh, Pelagius wasn't teaching anything new, but on the other hand, he wasn't teaching what he was accused of teaching. 
but it, it's funny and, and you had a problem with that of course but but it's funny because in the video i'm not i'm not sure if it was you or dr bonner but i believe one of you confirmed that pelagius uh, was actually accused of denying original sin yet you also make the argument that the church was not teaching original sin so which one is it right and i, I know i already brought this up before but but I want to make this a little bit clearer because I don't know if you understood me the first time. Was Pelagius falsely accused of denying original sin in his teachings? Meaning that he didn't teach there was no original sin? Or was that something that he was teaching because the church was also teaching there is no original sin? Do you see the problem? I hope that you're, you're starting to see what I'm saying. I really wish you had continued to watch my video because I actually gave the specific that you the, the specific excuse me that you say that I don't address like Pelagius is teaching on original sin grace you know etc. I, I even posted or, or provided quotes by Pelagius himself proving that he did indeed teach the things that he was accused of teachings. Uh, so so you know <laughs> that's why I said you know I wish you had watched the uh, the video but. Hey, that's okay. Anyway, so that was the one major thing that you addressed in regards to my video response to your Pelagius video with Dr. Bonner. So now I want to go ahead and address a few things you said while critiquing the other video I had on Calvinism. And this one, you gave a lot more feedback, so I'm going to spend way more time on it. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Okay, so you said Calvinists suggest that spiritual deadness equals inability. And then you go on to argue how that's actually not the case. But, but here's the thing. If you are spiritually dead, how can you do something that is spiritual in nature? Right? You, you say the best Calvinists have is the analogy of Lazarus and how that's applied wrongly to prove spiritual deadness. Now, listen, I'm, I, the, the, the analogy of Lazarus, I can understand the problem, right? Like you're saying, okay, well, Lazarus was physically dead. The, the, the Bible speaks about us being spiritually dead, and those are distinct. I will agree that it's not the same, right? I, I, but I, I will disagree in saying that, that it's a bad analogy. I will also disagree on uh, saying that that's the best that we have. Because I, I disagree that, that that is actually not the best that we have. It is a good point, right? Because there is a parallel between being physically dead, not being able to do anything, and being spiritually dead, not being able to do anything spiritual, okay? But I want to give you something to consider. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 2.14. It says this, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So here's the question. How can a spiritually dead person spiritually discern the gospel right if somebody is spiritually dead and and the gospel is about giving spiritual life how is it that somebody that is spiritually dead can discern that well i'm pretty sure that they, they can't let look at john 1 11 through 13 it says this he came to his own that's jesus he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. How do people become children of God? By believing. How do people believe? It says they're born again. And how are people born again? It's not by the will of the flesh, not by the will of man, not by blood, right? No, not inheritance, right? A lot of people, Jewish people thought, um, well, we are children of Abraham, therefore we will we'll inherit eternal life through the Messiah. No, it's not through blood, not through the will of the flesh, not through the will of man. How are you born again? Of God. Of God. We are not born again because we put our faith in in Christ. We are born again and we put our faith in Christ. And that's 
the crux of the matter. That's the issue that we're having here, right? That's where we would disagree. I mean, you and I and, and whoever else is watching that that doesn't agree with Calvinism. But the scriptures, to me, are, are pretty pretty clear. And Dr. Flowers, one of the things that you said in your video is, you know, don't 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 give me uh, your your I think it was like you said like your theology or don't give me your thoughts, don't give me your opinions, give me scripture. Believe me, I'm gonna give you scripture. I'm gonna give you scripture. I can't talk today. I apologize. <laughs> I'm gonna give you scripture. But we're already starting off by understanding right First Corinthians two fourteen. I want you to remember that because we're going to relate that to a lot of other things. Um, we cannot spiritually discern things in our natural state. Well, what's our natural state? Listen, here's the thing. Even if you believe that the order in which we are born again is first we believe, then we're born again. Before we believe, before we're born again, we are in a natural state of being. Right? We're in the natural state of man uh, who is sinful. And so, um, this verse is telling us right here, if you're in that natural state, you cannot spiritually discern things. Specifically, the things of the Spirit of God. I, I understand you're probably already thinking of how to respond to this. I know you probably already have an answer. So let, let's just keep going, okay? All right, you say, if people are regenerate, they don't need to see Jesus' miracles to believe. So I, I think what you were trying to say here, if I recall correctly, is that under the Calvinist view, there's no need for Jesus to convince people to believe in him with miracles since they only need to be regenerate, right? I'm I'm assuming that's what you were saying. So here's the thing. What regeneration does is that it gives one the ability to believe the signs and wonders. Right? So, so regeneration isn't just like, a, boom, you're enlightened and you know everything, right? You know the gospel. You, you understand everything all at once. No. Um, what, what regeneration means is that God is opening the heart to understand what you're seeing, what you're hearing, that kind of thing. So it, it, regeneration is to not simply go to the default that man has in his heart and deny the things of God, right? So, so think about it. How many people saw uh, these signs that Jesus was doing and they still didn't believe? I mean, they saw, they saw Jesus make blind men see. They saw Jesus make lame, lame men walk. They saw Jesus multiply bread and fish, why would somebody why would somebody see those things happen and still not believe the fact is they didn't want to believe and they can't help it because that is the condition that they're in right their their will their desire is to do what is evil not to accept the things of the Spirit of God. How do you multiply fish? How do you make a lame man walk or a, a blind man see? The Spirit. The Spirit. The Spirit gives life, right? The Spirit heals. So you need your heart opened. Because in your natural human state, right, the fallen nature, you, you, you can't understand these things. You will, it's not just that you can't understand these things. It's that you don't want to believe these things. All right. So let's do the next one. I admit that this next one is a paraphrase. Okay. I was trying to make a note of it, but I missed some of what you were saying and, and I wasn't able to go back. So I kind of had to get the gist of it. Um, and <laughs> it, it was something along the lines of why... Why don't Calvinists embrace total depravity as to mean that people are as bad as they can be? It's because they don't know, or sorry, it's because they know people don't do as much bad as they could because people are not blind to moral good. 
So I agree that, that people aren't blind to moral good, right? Like Romans 2, 12 through 16 says this. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who, are, who will be justified. For when the Gentiles, who do not have the law, by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Okay, so people have the moral law of God written in their hearts. The problem is that, that people are totally depraved. And, and you know, you, you said it yourself, we don't believe that total depravity uh, means that people are being as evil as they could be, right? I, I would agree with you on that one. We, we, we don't believe that. No, what, what we mean with total depravity is that every aspect of man, right? Our mind, our will, our flesh, everything is corrupted by sin because of the fall. So we can't keep the law perfectly. We have a conscience, but it, it's at war with our will, right? There's this conflict because our will wants to do evil. So, without God opening our hearts to understand, we will continue to deny that which comes from him and only love evil. All right? It's not that we don't understand what is right or wrong, but we love what is wrong. <laughs> that's that's really what it comes down to. Check check this out. I want to read to you Deuteronomy 29 verses 2 through 4. Listen to this. And Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, the great trials that your eyes saw, the signs, and those great wonders. But to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to understand, or eyes to see, or ears to hear. The Israelites saw miracles. They saw awesome things. They saw the spirit take the firstborn of the Egyptians. They saw all these plagues. They were protected, right? But, but they saw all these plagues. They saw the parting of the Red Sea. They, they, they saw all these things, right? Um, manna from heaven, quail, <laughs> all these things. God was taking care of them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but the, this passage says that even though they saw all these things, they didn't believe because they didn't want to. No, <laughs> it's not that. Well, it's true. They didn't want to, but why is it that they couldn't believe? Well, the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. Do you see? Do you see what the scriptures are telling us? What the word of God is saying? This is not some, some invented thing by Augustine. This is, this is not just some like Gnostic idea. <laughs> I, always, I always laugh a little bit when, when people say that like, yeah, like Calvinism comes from like Gnosticism. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. I'm looking at the word of God. I'm looking at the word of God, period. And it says that the Lord has to open your heart. All right. So, right. I, I, I do want to point this out. Calvinists don't believe people are born unable to differentiate between right and wrong. Okay. We, we believe that people can know what is right and what is wrong. But, we believe that because people are blind to the things of God, they're blind to the seriousness of thing, uh, of sin, excuse me, and because they love darkness rather than light, they cannot repent and believe because they don't want to repent and believe. Remember back to John 1, right? Um, or I'm sorry, John, John, is it John 1 or John 3, right? Where it says that men love darkness more than light. I know it's in John. 
But people love darkness more than light. And they can't repent because they love that darkness too much. It's, it's a matter of the will and what the will wants, right? Let's, let's go to the next thing. You said you're, you're giving people an excuse not, to not believe when you say they're unable to believe. Let me say that again so it comes out clear. You are giving people an excuse not to believe when you say that they are unable to believe. Incorrect. Incorrect. I'm not giving people anything. Because people still know right from wrong. We don't deny that people uh, uh, know right from wrong. Their ability to believe in God is, is independent of that. And by the way, uh, believe God and believe in God are two different things. right? When we say that people uh, believe God, it's that they actually put their trust in God. That, they, that they're walking by faith. right? Like uh, demons believe in God. <laughs> you know, but, but it doesn't mean that they believe God. I mean, maybe they believe that they believe God, but they don't care. But they're not trusting in God, right? And they're not trying to do the right thing. It's the same thing with, with the natural man. Natural man may, may even believe in God, but it doesn't mean that they actually believe him. They're like, no, I'm, I'm fine. I don't need the gospel. I can do things just by myself. I'm fine. Or maybe they don't believe they're going to end up in hell. I don't know. Different things. Different things that they could be rejecting. The point is that they don't believe God. And they can't. They don't want to. They don't want to believe God. And they can't. Because their will is to love what is evil. Alrighty. So, let's go to the next one. Alright, so you said, The Bible never says, I will arbitrarily give people life so that they believe in me. Well, putting, putting the word arbitrarily to the side... <laughs> I want you to look at John uh, 3, 7, 3, 8. John 3, 7, 3, 8. By the way, when I laugh, I'm, I'm not mocking. So please don't, don't take it that way. I just love to laugh. Okay. John 3, 7, 2, 8 says this. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. This says that the spirit is like the wind. Well, what does that mean? Well, you don't, you don't know where the wind comes from. You don't you know don't, don't know where the wind goes. It's the same thing with the spirit. He goes where he wishes, giving life to whomever he wishes. Right? So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Comes and goes. And it, it's not, it's not, it's unconditional. It's unconditional. It's not anything that we do. It's not praying a prayer. It's not asking Jesus into your heart. It's not hearing the gospel and then being smarter than everybody else and saying, well, you know, there's the, this gospel thing. It sounds good. I'm, you know what? I'm going to believe it. No, <laughs> no, it, that, no, it, it, it's all up to God. Nothing that we can do. Right, because our natural state is to just seek after evil things. Like that that's that's the condition that we're in. So yeah, I mean, let's keep going. I, I'm sure that you have more to say, um, but I have more Bible verses. You say you want scripture, you got it. And, and again, I'm I'm listen, I'm not I'm not trying to be snarky. I promise that's I, I'll tell you a quick story before I go on. So when, um, I, I wasn't always a Calvinist. Okay. So I, um, I actually hated, hated Calvinism when I first heard of it. And, um, aside from the fact that I hated Calvinism just because it wasn't what I, what I thought, right? Like, like that's not how I knew God to be like he chooses us. We don't choose him, that kind of thing. Um, another reason why I hated Calvinism was because I found the Calvinists to be extremely arrogant. So it just made me all the angrier at Calvinists. And so I, I spent like over a year trying to prove them wrong. And, you know, the more I, I, I searched, the more I was like, oh, man, like, I think this is true. Like, the more I would study the scriptures, like, I wasn't I wasn't going to to any, like, books or videos. I mean, eventually I did. Eventually I did. But but um, at first, like, I would say, like, the first, 
at least five or six months. I was like, no, I'm just going to read the Bible. I'm just going to read the Bible. And I, I, I stuck with the New Testament at first, and then I started looking at the Old Testament. Um, but, but anyway, all this to say, I'm not trying to bore you with my life story of how I came to Calvinism. Um, all I'm trying to say is that um, I know that there are Calvinists that can come off as arrogant or you know they're, they're trying to be smarter than everybody else. And please don't take this, Dr. Flowers, if you're still watching, if you made it this far, uh, please don't take that, don't, don't take this that way, because that's, that's not what I'm intending to do here at all, okay? All right, so, okay, so yeah, so at one point, it sounded like you were trying to say that in uh, John 6, 44, right, no one can come to, the, to me unless the Father draws him, it sounded like you were saying that Everyone who hears the gospel uh, is being drawn, right? Like according to John six forty four, I, I, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you're saying that according to John six forty four, uh, everyone who hears the gospel is being drawn, and people can resist that drawing. So the problem with that argument, this is going to be a quick one, but the problem with that argument is that a couple of verses earlier, right? Verse 37 says that all that the father gives me will come to me. Jesus said, all that the father gives me will come to me. So if God is drawing all these people to give to Jesus, then why would they not come to him if he says that all of them are going to come to him? You see what I'm saying? So again, maybe I misunderstood what you were saying about John 6, 44, but if if you were saying what I believe you were saying, then uh, no, I, I would reject that assertion that, that everyone that hears the gospel is being drawn. That, that's impossible because Jesus says, well, unless you believe, I uh, will say this. If you believe that everybody that hears the gospel will believe, then okay, I guess, um, I guess you've got something there. I wouldn't necessarily say I agree with you because there's other passages to refute that. But if that's what you're saying, okay, fine. You know, just in isolation, I can see where you're going with that. Although, again, we could dig deeper, right, in Scripture, and we would find out even that's wrong. So I don't believe that that's what you're saying, by the way. But I'm just saying if you were. All right, so next thing you said, uh, a person can become more and more hostile to God, but unlike Calvinists, we blame man, we being provisionists, not God. So we provisionists blame man, not God, for man becoming more and more hostile to God. Well, no. <laughs> I mean, not know that you guys don't um, don't blame man. I, I do agree with that. But what I'm saying is your 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 assertion about Calvinists here. Calvinism still asserts that man is responsible for rejecting God. Look at Romans 1, 18 through 23. Yeah, 18 through 23. All right, it says this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Okay, so... Man is, is responsible for rejecting God. Man can see the evidence all around him that there is a creator. So when man rejects God, he has no excuse. And, and we believe that. Yes, Calvinists believe that. You know, we don't deny that. We don't deny that man knows that God exists. We don't deny that man knows right from wrong. What we deny is that man wants to follow God out of his own will. Man is blind to the idea of loving God. He's blind to the idea of believing the gospel. Why? Right? That, that, that's the question. Why? Because man 
loves darkness rather than light. And the more man violates his conscience, the deeper into the darkness that he goes. God is giving him over to his sin more and more and more. He's giving man exactly what he wants, period. That, that's really what it comes down to. God is giving man exactly what he wants. What man wants is to keep going, right? Like, think about, think about people that you may know or maybe even yourself before you were saved. What is it that you used to do, right? Like, the kinds of sins I used to do. I don't want you to, like, reflect on them and start thinking inappropriate things. But, but systematically think about how, like, you would get deeper and deeper. Like, for example, let's say you were a compulsive liar. What do you do as a liar? Well, you, you lie, first small, you realize that like, mm, I, I didn't get in trouble, so uh, that gets me what I want, let me go deeper, let me, let me lie more, let me, let me, you know, if you keep going down that path, what's going to happen? You're going to be a compulsive liar, right? And, you know, when you think about people who, who are the worst of the worst, like in prison, do you think that these people just became like the absolute scum of the earth because um, because they've always been that way? No. No. We Calvinists, we, we know that. We know that people have the law of God written in their hearts, right? We do believe that they are totally corrupted, right? In, 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 in mind, in conscience, in the will, in the flesh, etc. So... Um, as that corruption continues to essentially run in our system, right? In our mind, in our heart, etc. Unless God intervenes and, and, and keeps people from sinning as much as they could, which um, I think there's an argument to be made from scripture that that is what happens. So, for example, Abraham, uh, when, uh, when he lied about Sarah being his wife, uh, I forgot the king that he was uh, speaking with, but the king took uh, Sarah... To, to be his wife, thinking that uh, she was Abraham's sister. Abraham had lied because he was afraid, like, oh, they're going to see my wife, they're going to see how beautiful she is, and they're going to kill me so she, they can have her. So I'll just say she's my sister. But one of the things that happened is that this king, again, I forgot his name, so I apologize. But one of the things that he says to Abraham, well, actually, before he says anything to Abraham, God comes to him in a dream and reveals that Sarah is actually Abraham's wife. And what he says to Abraham is, God kept me from sinning, right? I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but that's essentially what he says. So, um, and then there, there's other things that we can talk about that kind of go down that path. But, but the point is that God does restrain sin and sinful man from being as sinful as he, as he could be through means, right? Like, I, I don't disagree with means. Um, situations in his or her life, which actually kind of leads me to my next point. Uh, because you, you said this, you said, we believe God works through human means and those means are sufficient enough. So I, I would agree that um, God works through means. I, Calvinists believe that God works through means. We believe in preaching the gospel, for example. But the Bible speaks on how we as people respond to those means that are going on around us. Okay, so for example, Acts 16, or yeah, yeah, Acts 16. So, so Paul is preaching the gospel, right? And in verse 14, you, re you recall what, what happens in verse 14, right? As Paul is preaching the gospel, God, it, it, verse 14 says, God opened Lydia's heart to listen to what Paul was saying, to listen to what Paul had to say. So Paul was, there was a means, right? Like he was preaching the gospel, but it's still was necessary for God to open the heart of Lydia to listen to what um, what Paul was saying. And so it's important that we keep that in mind, right? Because I'm not saying that, um, that God doesn't use means, but that through those means, he's opening hearts. He is working supernaturally, right? It's not just like a, just ordinary means um, that are that are common to man, but God works supernaturally through those means. Okay. 
Alrighty, next thing. So you said, man blinds himself to the message of the gospel. Yes and amen. <laughs> you know, a Calvinist would never disagree with you on that one. But why? That, that's the question. But why does man blind himself to the message of the gospel? Again, I keep bringing this up, but, but it's important to understand this. Man loves darkness rather than light. And so he goes deeper into the darkness, suppressing the truth more and more, right? Like think again, my earlier example of somebody lying and lying more and lying more and lying more. Does that person not want to forget to ignore that what they're doing is sinful, that what they're doing is wrong? Don't they want to forget the truth that there is a creator, right? That they have to acknowledge as creator that they have to listen to his law, to his rules, to the law that's written in their hearts. They're searing their consciences the more they do it, right? They're going deeper into that darkness. And so they have to suppress that truth more and more and more. Uh, okay, so let's go to the next thing. Okay, so then you begin discussing Romans 3. And the whole no one seeks after God thing, right? Like you start talking about that. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you seem to be implying that some people seem to feel guilty and, uh, you know, for their sin and, and genuinely they're seeking after God. Well, so, so essentially, you know, what your argument is, well, what do you do with those people, right? Like clearly they're looking for God. They, they seem to be feeling guilty for their sin. They seem to be like they're looking for, for an answer, right? Well, number one, I would say, number one, it's, it's possible that they are regenerate and, and they're just working through that, right? They're, they're just working through the fact that they've been regenerated. Or number two, they know that they're guilty because man has the law of God written in his heart, as we already established. And so they're looking to get rid of the feeling of guilt because it's unpleasant. Uh, but it's not necessarily because they're seeking after God for who he is, right? The creator that is worthy to be worshipped. So, so yeah, that, that argument doesn't really prove that people seek for God. Uh, think, think about this. 9-11. Uh, I th Did I bring up 9-11 already? I don't remember. But 9-11, but um, I remember after 9-11, a lot of people were scared. And so a lot of people started packing churches. I mean, churches were absolutely packed. I remember my own church was absolutely packed during that time. And um, within two or three weeks... It just was business as usual. People people stopped going to church. Why? Because they got what they needed. They they were scared and they were seeking comfort. They probably noticed, okay, like there's no more terrorist attacks going on. You know, like things are getting back to normal. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm good to go. And, and that's how people operate, right? People seek after God's blessing. And I think Keith addressed this in the video as well, but... I'm not trying to bring him into it. This is just you and me right now. Um, but but this was addressed in the video that you were criticizing. Like people want the God's blessing. Like if he were a genie, right? Like hey, I need something. Hey, my my life is in ruins right now. Hey, please help me. Hey, I'm, maybe I'm feeling guilty about something. Hey, ease the the pain of my sin. But that that doesn't mean that they love God for who He is. Think about it like this. Like, let, let's say their life was perfect. Like, they don't feel any pain. They don't have any sickness. They don't have anything that they need. Right? Like, everything is provided for. What's gonna, what are they going to do? <laughs> well, they're not going to seek after God. At least, if they're not regenerate. They're not going to seek after God. They don't love God. They don't care for God. They'll be like, I'm good. I'm good. I don't, I don't need God. So, clearly, man does not actually care about God. At least not before he's regenerated. Uh, think about Judas, right? He felt the way of betraying Jesus, right? He felt that, but he wasn't saved. If you look at look look at Matthew 26, 24, look at John 17, 12, it's pretty much right there. Like Judas was not saved. He wasn't. He was the son of perdition, right? So you can have guilt. That doesn't mean that you're seeking God just because you're looking to get rid of your guilt. Judas tried to get rid of his guilt by returning the, the 30 uh, coins, 30 pieces of silver, excuse me. But 
that's not what did it, right? Like he he didn't have true repentance, understanding that God is worthy to be praised. And like, see that that's the problem, right? Like, there's a difference between feeling guilty over your sin and feeling guilty over your sin because you understand that um, that that's not what pleases God, and you realize like, ah, man, like I should be worshiping God. I should be worshiping my Creator. That's the difference. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, you also said that when uh, Romans 3 is talking about how no one seeks after God, you said Paul isn't literally saying that no one seeks after God. Okay, so <laughs> the problem with that is that in Romans 3, 9, um, Paul says that both Jews and Greeks are under sin. And so the application of no one seeking after God applies to all who are under sin. Think about how the, the passage progresses, right? Like he's saying uh, both Jews and Greeks are under sin and therefore no one seeks after God. So are we all under this under sin before we're, we're saved? I would hope you would say, yeah, like we are all under sin before we're saved. So if that is the case, then according to what Paul is saying, no one seeks for God whenever we're under sin. So it's it's not really a good argument to say um, that Paul isn't literally saying that no one seeks for God. No, no one seeks for God when they're in their uh, sin nature. And again, that's that's how the passage naturally flows. So that about does it. Like I said, I, I didn't watch the whole video, but you know, I, everything I covered is, is pretty much the one hour, the first hour or so. So if you are watching this and you want to watch the whole thing, you can find the link of the video in the description below. Dr. Flowers, if you got through this whole thing and you're still with me, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I hope you consider what I've said here. I, I'm sure, I'm sure that you've heard a lot of these things before. But, but who knows? <laughs> maybe, maybe this time God is opening your heart to understand it. <laughs> so, hey, you know, well, we, for those of you guys uh, watching, pray, pray for Dr. Flowers. You never know. Anyway, guys, so thank you very much for watching. Let me know what you think in the comments. If you found this video helpful or you haven't subscribed, go ahead and subscribe. And uh, yeah, yeah, I hope this was helpful, guys. Until next time, God bless.